Well, hey, I want to welcome you in today. Uh, I don't know where you find yourself in the world today, but I am so glad that you've chosen to worship with us here at Christ Church today. Uh, if you've been following along over the last couple of weeks, uh, you know that we have been in a series entitled Mic Drop as we kind of hand select certain Proverbs from the book of Proverbs and expound on the wisdom uh, from God that lies in those. And so uh, today what I hope to do, if this is maybe your first day joining us, uh, what I want to do is give you just a little bit of background on the book of Proverbs, how this book came to be. And in order to, to kind of figure out the origin story of the book of Proverbs, we need to go back to 1 Kings chapter 3. Now in this moment, Solomon has been appointed king over all of Israel. And in a dream, uh, God visits him and, and makes this statement to him, ask me whatever you want. And, and so Solomon, in his dream, says this, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or to number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Now, put yourself in this scenario for a moment and realize that, that Solomon could have asked for anything. He could have asked for a, a long life. He could have asked for a, a long reign of power as king over all of Israel. He could have asked for riches and wealth untold. And instead, in a moment of, of human wisdom, he says, God, give me your wisdom. Show me your wisdom so I can know how best to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong by your standard. And in turn, to be able to govern these people rightly. Well, because it's such a selfless request, God grants it. And in fact, he gives them he gives him even what he didn't ask for. He gives him wealth. He, he gives him long life. He gives them a great rule. But it leads us to this compilation of wisdom proverbs that we find in the book of Proverbs. Now, if you were here for the first week, one of the things that Jeff said was, we have to be careful as we're reading the book of Proverbs not to believe that these are promises. That if we do the things in the book of Proverbs, that it will lead to a life without frustration, a life without issues. No, we, we live in a fallen world. So while this is God's wisdom given to us as to the best way to live, it does not mean that life is always going to be perfect. It doesn't mean if you follow these Proverbs to the letter that everything will work out in your favor. But what it is giving us are principles based on the wisdom of God as to how best to navigate this life that we've been given. And as we look at the book of Proverbs as a whole, I believe that, that in Proverbs chapter one, Solomon has kind of given us through God and his wisdom, the thesis statement of what wisdom is. And it's found in chapter one, verse seven. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, what, what Solomon is saying here is not so much being afraid, although there is an element of, of in awe and of reverence of God. We, we do recognize that we don't measure up. But what the fear of the Lord actually means is, is this recognition that God is so far above us that, that when we approach Him, we approach him in awe and in reverence and in respect because we recognize he is the creator of the universe. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools, and that word fools literally translates to someone who does not believe in God. 
Now they may say they believe in God, but by the way they live their life, by the words that they say, by the actions that they take, their lives speak that they do not believe that God is above them. They do not believe that God necessarily even exists. And so there's a contrasting here that we see that those who follow the Lord, they'll know wisdom, they'll know knowledge. But those who rely on themselves will find that the wisdom and knowledge they believe they've accrued will always fall short. And so what Solomon is doing here in Proverbs chapter 1 is he's, he's trying to set the stage for where wisdom comes from, where perfect wisdom comes from, and it's found only through God. And so the proverb that uh, I've chosen this morning is found in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 5. So let's read that together. It says, Evildoers do not understand what is right, but those who seek the Lord, they understand it fully. And so in, in today's scripture, the area of life that Solomon is, is expounding God's wisdom upon is the area of justice. Now, I probably don't have to tell you, but justice is a word that seemingly gets thrown around very, very quickly these days. In fact, a lot of our society, in fact, of what, a lot of what we see happening in our culture seems to revolve around this idea of justice. And one of the phenomenon that I think we've seen over the last couple of years as it relates to justice is this narrowing of the focus of justice from simply a determination based on a moral standard of what is right and what is wrong to more of a narrow focus as to what is the evaluation of every angle of life in order to determine what is fair and what is not? What is equitable and what's not? And perhaps even more dangerous, this standard of justice in this new sense it is now based less on God's moral standard and more on the emotions of the parties involved you can start to see that it's already a slippery slope and one that, that is really tough to navigate. And the bigger issue is that it started to creep in to the church as well. And so today, what I hope to do is, is maybe bring this to light, this term that we hear in our culture of social justice. But as we lay out what that is, even more importantly, I, I hope to show you through what God's Word says as to why we in and of ourselves cannot be the arbiters of truth. We cannot be the standard bearers of wisdom and justice. And so what I want to do is I want to go into Romans chapter 3 to really highlight uh, this idea. Romans chapter 3 is written by the Apostle Paul. As he writes to the Romans, uh, the Roman church, he's very, very honest. He's very blunt about the state of the human heart. He pulls no punches. And so listen to what Paul writes in chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 9. He says, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. And here's the key. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we contrast to what, uh, what Solomon has written uh, in chapter 1 of Proverbs when he says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, is the, the reverence, the awe, the respect, the worship of God. And as Paul is laying out the state of the human heart naturally, he says 
That doesn't exist. In the human heart, naturally, apart from Christ, there is no one who who just naturally fears God in the sense of, of approaching Him with awe and of reverence and of worship. In fact, the state of the human heart seeks uh, or causes us to seek to worship us. We become the center of the universe. This is the problem with the human heart, as Paul has so bluntly laid out. Now, as we contrast this with the social justice movement that has uh, infiltrated our culture, Uh, that is seemingly found at at every twist and turn in our society today. I want to give you just a couple of characteristics of this movement. Now, in doing this, I want to be cautious. I want to approach this humbly. I want to approach this empathetically. That, listen, I recognize that there are people who have suffered injustices. There are many people to which life has, has been very, very cruel to. And the reality is, is this is a part of life in a fallen world. And so let me just lay out some of the characteristics of this social justice movement that has started to creep in to the church. The social justice movement demands that that you and I be labeled into a certain group, whether that is an oppressor group or whether that is a victim group. And the reality of this movement is that you can fall into many different groups. You can be in many oppressor groups. You can be in many victim groups all at the same time. Now contrast this to what Paul has written in Romans chapter 3. He puts us all in one group. He says there is one group that everyone falls into. Sinners. That all Jews, all Gentiles, which is everyone alike, falls into one category. That in the grand scheme of things, we fall into the category of sinners. There is a difference between the social justice movement and what the gospel says. The social justice movement demands that you recognize the sins of the collective group or you blame someone if you're in the victim group. Now again, I don't want to gloss over the fact that there are people who have suffered injustices. But the reality of the Word of God says this. Let's let's look at Ezekiel chapter 18. As we approach this idea of of collective sin or or group uh, uh, sin by association, contrast that to what God says through Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 18. It says, For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. Now, Ezekiel is answering this question of, is a son held accountable for the sin of his father? And is a father held accountable for the sin of his son? And God speaking through Ezekiel says, no, everyone is accountable for their own sin. You're not not accountable for the sins of the collective group, but you are accountable for the sins of you. This is the reality that all of us face. That all of us, as Paul has so blatantly told us, are sinful men and women. We have we've fallen short of the glory of God and we are accountable for those sins. And the social justice movement demands that you repent and repay for the sins of the collective group. Again, we recognize that that we, because of what God's word says, we are accountable to our sins. We are accountable to our personal sins. And the reality of what God's word says about us and, and what is coming for the sinner is that there is a day of reckoning for those. It is that we have stored up God's wrath by going away from him, by disobeying his commands, by by following after our own hearts and placing ourselves at the throne of the universe. We'll answer for that. And wrath has to be poured out. Listen, God is just. He is just. He is a good judge. And like any good judge, the penalty must be given for the sins. 
so the, the good news of the gospel is this. Jesus Christ has made a way for all of God's wrath that is due to be poured out on you has already been poured out on him. The reality of the gospel is that you have a decision. Will you take the wrath of God on yourself forever? Or will you accept that it has been poured out fully, completely, and totally through the person and the work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross? This is the differentiating factor between the social justice movement that has started to infiltrate the church and what the gospel says. And so let me just lay this out as as bluntly as I can for us today. That as we approach this proverb and as we look at the idea of justice, we have the advantage of viewing it through God's perspective viewing it through the way he sees things as told to Solomon and now relayed to us. And the reality of how God sees things from a macro level is that there are no victims. Listen, the, the foundational truth that is at the core of the gospel lies this truth. There are no victims. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You have a problem. I have a problem. And this victim game that we play because of the social justice movement is one of the least of our problems. The first and foremost problem that the gospel lays out for us is that we have fallen short of the glory of God, that we have chosen to go our own way and we are deserving of God's wrath. Church, this is the biggest problem you face. Whatever oppression you may feel, whatever uh, victimhood you may feel, whatever, th- whatever is unfair, whatever is unequitable in your life, listen, I don't want to gloss over that. But the reality is, it is not the biggest problem that you face. The biggest problem that you face is that you and I are sinners. This is the biggest problem that mankind has. Does it mean injustice doesn't exist in the world? Absolutely not. It absolutely does. In fact, it would be foolish of us to see things rightly, that this world is filled with sinful men and women and not expect injustice to abound. It does. We as a church are called to be empathetic to those things. We're called to to come alongside those and not look at it from a social justice perspective, but instead look at it through God's perspective of biblical justice. Look to his word to show us what is right and what is wrong. So we are called to pursue justice, but in accordance with the word. But again, whatever personal or social injustice that you see, or maybe you've experienced Church, it is not your biggest problem. Your sin is the biggest problem that you face. And so we want to be a people that are of sound mind, that that see things clearly. That as we approach uh, these issues, that as we're uh, in society, we're constantly bombarded by these things, we want to see things rightly. We want to see things clearly. This was Paul's goal as well as he wrote to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 2. He says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 4 is key. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Listen, these, these arguments that we see in our society about all of these social injustices that have taken place, they sound great. And it doesn't mean that, that those injustices aren't happening, but we want to see things rightly. 
And, and, and Paul writes to the Colossians, the way to see things rightly, the way to have wisdom and understanding and knowledge is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is the lens by which we have to view everything else. He continues in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. The reason why this passage is important as it relates to the social justice movement is that as it infiltrates the church and starts to take on this idea of being a social justice gospel, if you will, it starts to shift the way that salvation and redemption is found. When the social justice, ta- social justice gospel takes root in the church, what it leads people to believe is that salvation is found in how well or how often we call out injustices within the world. How many causes we can take up. What it's doing is it's shifting from a salvation that is based totally on the person and the work of Christ and it shifts it to the works that we ourselves do. I want to remind you what Paul has written in Ephesians chapter 2 as it pertains to this works-based salvation. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Believer, make no mistake about it. You are not saved by what you do. You are saved by Christ and Christ alone. It changes your heart. It transforms what you do. But you are not saved by the causes that you take up. You are saved by Christ and His work, His completed work on the cross. So what do we do as transformed, as redeemed people? What do we do? What do we do as compared to uh, this social justice movement that has infiltrated seemingly every corner of our world? Well, believers, you are called to see things through a biblical worldview. I think all of these scripture are clear that this is the way that we see things rightly. We recognize that the problem is not just circumstantial things. The problem that we have is sin. And we need a Savior. And that Savior is not found in us. It is not found in a cause. It is not found in any other person other than Christ. But Micah 6, 8 says this. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. Meaning He is the arbiter of truth. He is the standard of what is right and what is wrong. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. All of that to say, God is the source of justice, perfect justice. It's not you, it's not me. It is found when believers will submit to the authority of the word of God that he has given us and recognize That truth is not found in us. That truth is found in God, the creator of everything. And we recognize as we approach these societal issues that we don't become hardened to them, that we don't become non-empathetic to the struggles of people. But we recognize that as believers, our biggest cause is for people to know that they are sinners as, as offensive, as hard as that is to hear, this is the biggest problem that they face. And the reality of what we've been called to do is we've called to give, been called to give them the gospel message. That we are sinners. That we are deserving of the wrath of God. And that it will be poured out on those who have not confessed in Jesus Christ. But to those who have, to those who have submitted to him, as we get ready to to take communion to celebrate this fact, the reality is 
is that all of the wrath of God Everything that was due for you and for me has been taken completely and forever because of what Jesus did on the cross. Justice was served. Maybe it wasn't poured out on you, but the penalty of your sin was poured out on Jesus Christ if you're a believer in him. As we get ready to celebrate communion, I would encourage you to to grab some supplies uh, wherever you're watching this. And recognize for a moment what Christ has saved you from. An eternity separated from Him. Never ending. 10,000 years would just be a blip on the radar of eternity. This is what you and I chose. We chose to go our own way. And instead, for those who believe, for those who have trusted in Christ, we can have a relationship with the Father now. We can approach the throne of grace confidently. Not because of our merit, not because of any works we've done, but because when He sees you, He sees the perfection of His Son. This is the great news of the gospel, church. So as we celebrate, we remember that that broken body and that shed blood shows us the links that God went to to save humanity for those who would trust in Him. That we did not deserve it, that we didn't earn it, but we graciously and thanksgivingly accept it. The broken body and the shed blood tells us that the work of salvation is is complete. This is the good news of the gospel church. This is the gospel message that needs to be preached. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for what you've done. God, as we examine your word, we recognize that there is nothing good in us that all men and women have fallen short of your glory that we are deserving of your wrath, Father, but, but God, the good news of the gospel is that you took the penalty of all our sin, past, future, present, and you took it on on the cross. Father, as believers today, I pray that we would recognize that this is the biggest problem. Sin is the biggest problem that humanity faces that our world is broken, that injustice abounds because of sin. And God, no rectifying a temporary situation is going to change the fact that the sin must be punished. That you would not be just, you would not be holy, you would not be righteous if you didn't punish sin. Praise be to you, Father, that you have given us your Son. That his body was broken and his blood was shed so that we could be restored to a relationship with you. Father, may we never move on from that truth. May we never uh, look at that as something that is, is a truth to be moved on from or graduated from. This is our hope. And so, Father, we praise your name. You are holy, you are righteous, you are just. You are a good God. Help us to seek you and help us to see the world uh, through your word. Father, we again thank you for the gospel message that saves men from their sin. We put our hope and our trust in you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. for my soul.
Call me your citizen of here. 